Thanks to all of you for coming here and you know being with us this morning. I'm sure there are more interesting things to do, you know, on a Sunday morning. But thanks for being with us. Uh, thanks to you for bringing me all over from Turkey to Malaysia for the second time. I'm happy to see my friends like Wan here, and uh, we'll have time. Uh, of course, it's good for me to be in Malaysia because I'm learning more about the laws and the intricacies. Because in Turkey, I've been hearing like, oh, the word Allah has been banned. I was saying like, in what sense? You know, like, oh, like there's this issue on apostasy and so on and so forth. Now I can get a better sense of how exactly these things work. Uh, and I should say that I'm a Muslim, I'm proud of my faith, and I think it's my path to salvation. But I also think that in the Muslim world, not because of Islam, but because of our cultural and political codes, we have a lot of authoritarianism. And many people think that that authoritarianism is an integral part of Islam. I don't think it's an integral part of Islam. It's just, you know, happened to be strong uh, for a lot of cultural reasons. And we can understand Islam separately from that authoritarian mindset. Uh, well, by authoritarianism, what do we mean? Uh, and with regards to especially the freedom of speech. By authoritarianism, we mean that there is someone out there who knows what is good for us and who has the authority and the right to Uh, and that somebody can be the head of a shura council, or a president, or an ayatollah, or a Sunni scholar, or somebody. Uh, and that person's, their authorities, ideas are cert somehow unquestionable. Uh, why unquestionable? Well, you're not supposed to ask that anyway, so it's unquestionable. So, I mean, the question should stop at some point. But we have to ask, why is it unquestionable? Uh, and, of course, some people will say, because this is religion, because in religion you have to believe, and so on and so forth. But I think it's not that simple. And religion throughout the centuries has been used, our religion and other religions, has been used to empower authorities who are just human beings like us. Prophets are separate. You know, they have received God's revelation. But be besides the prophets, I don't think there's anybody in Islam who can say, I have divine knowledge and you all have to obey me. There's nobody like this in Islam. There are learned scholars with an opinion. There's another scholar with a different opinion. He's learned, but he looks at things from a different point of view. And that diversity of Islamic thought has, from the beginning, our strength, but we have lost that diversity to a great extent, and that's why it's time to rethink these issues. Now, on the especially issue of freedom of speech, first of all, let's think what freedom of speech means and why there's a concept like that. Uh, again, as I also mentioned yesterday, freedom of speech is based on an assumption that there is nobody among us who is absolutely more wise, who is smarter than us, and who has the right to dictate to us. Because if somebody knows the truth, certainly, that there is no need for freedom of speech. Freedom of speech will be only noise, nonsense. There will be a lot of noise. If somebody among us here, like some elevated person, he's certainly wiser and he knows everything better than us, and he knows everything better for each of us, we shouldn't do nothing but listen to that person. Uh, but if there is no such person, if there is no such authority who knows everything for us, I'm not saying a text, but a person here, uh, then we have to share ideas to find out what is the good thing. I mean, should we have AC here or not? Well, let's discuss. I mean, I think we should. <laughs> Many people maybe can agree. Uh, what, what is the best way of organizing our lives? What are the better ideas? I mean, if there is nobody who can dictate that, we should discuss. Of course, states dictate that through law, but that legal process should you know, happen through after some discussion, not when somebody says, I am the law, and I make this discussion. Uh, okay, thank you. I was waiting for coffee. That's that's a great help, you know, to wake up, to wake up, especially when you're jet lagged in Malaysia, which is six hours different from Turkey. And let's recall how this, especially freedom of expression issue, became important in Europe. It is well. It was, of course, defended by liberal thinkers, but especially after Second World War. In Europe, in the West, freedom of speech became a very important value, defended and enshrined in constitutions. Why? 
Because Europeans notice that after a lot of horrible examples, I mean, fascism, Nazism, these are European ex uh, experiences, much worse than what we had, I mean, in our part of the world, when it comes to authoritarianism. They realize that if there is no freedom of speech in society, power creates its dynamic, and people start to bow down to power. And if nobody can question it, people can be actually manipulated by powerful governments through propaganda to a certain goal. I mean, Nazism, the craziest idea, one of the craziest ideas in world history, that you know some human race is more superior than others, and they should eliminate and destroy them and through some biological necessity and so on and so forth. It, it was propagated by the Nazi party and people, the fact that people could not speak out against it made other ideas be crushed by that. So that totalitarianism emerged. So in, in, in order to not allow totalitarian regimes to emerge, freedom of speech was very important because someone could get out and say, this is nonsense. Why are we believing the Führer? The Hitler has better ideas than all of us. Why, why can't we make fun of him? Why can't we joke? Why can't we criticize him? If that, if that value was strongly enshrined, maybe that experience would not take place. So after seeing that the suppression of free speech leads to horrible consequences, Europeans had developed the consciousness of free speech. Uh, and again, time and again, in different societies, in our societies as well, I see many examples of the blessings of free speech. For example, we will come to libel and insult and so on and so forth, which are more hot issues. But just let's come to the level of ideas, political philosophies, ideologies, uh, theologies, Islam, Christianity, atheism, different worldviews. Now, if there is freedom of speech, all of these ideas, philosophies, ideologies will be challenged by other ideas, right? You're a Muslim and someone will come say, I think Islam is wrong. I think you should be a Christian, and here's the reason. Or someone will say, well, I'm an atheist, and I think, dude, you're wrong. I think, I don't believe there's a God, and here's my evidence. And he will ask you, why do you believe in God? So you will face these contrary ideas. Now, in our part of the world, generally, Muslim authorities think that if such ideas are heard, Muslims will be confused. We will be, we will be misled. And it's a virus that we will be all drawn into. When someone says atheism is a good idea, we will all gradually become that. Not that they will, that person will be influenced by us, but we will be influenced by the person who has the wrong idea. Now, first of all, I think it's not very self-confident to think that we will be misled by that idea. But the other thing is that actually when you have that conversation with different ideas, your ideas, your own ideas get more mature because you learn how to respond to an atheist. If someone says, I don't believe in God, show me God, then you start to think, yeah, how would I defend my belief in God to this person? Well, if you put him in jail, you don't need to defend. Yeah, it's easy. But if you need to converse with that person, then you would say, okay, here, has my, here are my arguments. Well, believe in God because this, because that, because the design of the universe, our bodies, and, and, our, and the evidence from this, evidence from that, and cosmology, biology, whatever you believe in, is the, and, and your intuitions, and so on and so forth. The inner logic, the inner law that humans have, all can be shown as evidence for God. That's why when we look at, actually, uh, in the past couple of centuries, when we look at great thinkers, great ideas, great works of arts, they, most of them, it's changing now, but most of the time it came from the West. Why? Because these things were being discussed there, and the more you discuss, the more you mature, the more you become refined. And the thing is, if we protect our societies from all the harmful ideas, we will be left with very simplistic ideas. Uh, that very struggle between ideas makes every idea more mature, and I think we need more of that in our part of the world. Uh, the other thing is that freedom of speech also helps the moderation of ideas. Because when you can express an idea, you feel a bit more comfortable about it. If you're not allowed to express it, if you have an ideology that you want to advance, if you can write and speak about it and people listen or not listen, that's something. But if you're banned and put in prison for an ideology, you might become a little more angry. 
And you might resort to other means than just expressing your ideas. Well, you can set up the liberation front for the Marxist revolution or something. And the bourgeois doesn't allow you to speak, you bomb them. You know, This is, this is what happened in many parts of the world. Uh, in Turkey, for example, uh, in Turkey, our oppression on free speech came less from Islamic considerations, but more from nationalistic considerations. Turkish Republic has been madly nationalist in the 20th century. For example, Kurdish language and expressions of Kurdish culture were banned by our country for many years because we thought then they will become separatists if, he's, if they speak Kurdish. They should speak Turkish like us. If they speak Kurdish, uh, that will become a dangerous language and they will get into it and we should ban Kurdish so they will love you know, Turkey and so on and so forth. Well, the very fact that Turkey banned Kurdish became the reason for reaction and a lot of revolts against the government and ultimately a guerrilla army called PKK uh, whose war with the state killed more than 40,000 people in Turkey. After so many years of ban banning Kurdish, our politicians and statesmen said, maybe we shouldn't ban their language, maybe we should respect it. Good morning, you know, <laughs> nice, to, nice to notice that. And only thanks to that, the conflict is now silent and there's some cheese, some peace process that's going on uh, and and the fact the fact that also another thing it's not just language but it was the idea of separation the belief in Kurdish states for example Turkish government banned separ separationist propaganda so if you said we want a free Kurdistan or at least a federational Kurdistan that would be a crime in Turkey uh, and many people wanted that, many Kurdish nationalists. And the government thought that if you allow them to say this, more people will be drawn into this. But what happened was that when it became possible to discuss an independent Kurdistan, it was easy to show Kurdish nationalists that it will not be a good idea because it will be a poor country landlocked and it's not going to help anybody, including the Kurds. So the very fact that the idea could be discussed made it less appealing because its flaws were visible. That's why instead of fearing that ideas will spread, the ideas that we don't like will spread, let's say, come, let's discuss it, and let me show you that it's a wrong idea. And maybe you will learn something in the, in, in the process that will go on. So and I think these are the universal like, basics of free speech that I think uh, should mean to us. And when we, uh, when we look at, for example, uh, there is a big connection between democracy and internal peace. When you look at democratic countries in the world today, there has been some Marxist movements in Europe that, have, that, that were violent in the 70s and 80s, but generally these are peaceful countries because different ideas and political philosophies and ideologies can already express themselves and get into parliament. But if there is a totalitarian regime, the only opposition to the totalitarian regime is to get some Kalashnikov because the guys don't allow you to say anything you want. Therefore, the freedom of free speech also brings moderation in the sense that people can enter into conversation with others. Does free speech have limits? Everything has limits, right? Yeah. There are limits in North Korea, in US and Canada. They're all just different, you know, in different levels. Yes, there are limits, but uh, in, in, the, even in, the, in the most free countries of the world, there are limits. But these are objective limits. It's not that people will be misled or seduced or they will have wrong ideas because once you start to define wrong ideas, you're making a subjective statement here. Well, hate speech is not allowed, for example, in most countries of the world. If you say, uh, I think we should go and attack these people in our society, we should kill them and we should behead them, and so, that is hate speech against certain people. If you take some person and write libels against that person, that person has the right to go to court and say, sue you for libel for insult. So there are certain limitations and these vary from society to society. Uh, the US level is generally a bit higher than Europe when it comes to even free speech in terms of allowing you know, things like Holocaust denial and so, so, so on and so forth. And there are cultural differences between societies and different political histories. They can vary. But the general rule is that you ban free speech when it becomes a danger in terms of really calling violence against somebody or degrading some person and, and, and harming that person. Otherwise, just by giving wrong ideas, seductive ideas, by, by confusing people, that's, that's not an uh, acceptance for uh, limitation of free speech. Now, this is the scene from our rational, universal, whatever, logical point of view. 
But what does our religion say about this? What does Islam say? Well, my book, Islam Without Extremes, A Muslim Case for Liberty, is partly about that. And, uh, you know, it has all the arguments that I will, uh, detailed arguments that I will only highlight a few of them here today. First of all, let's go back to this idea. What I said about free speech is that why do we need free speech? Because I said, if someone knows the truth, we wouldn't need free speech, right? But if there's no one who knows everything right, we need free speech. Now, from an Islamic point of view, how is that statement? Now, some Muslims can say, of course in Islam, religion gives us the truth, uh, so we, we follow our religious leaders, so there is no need for free speech. But it's not that simple, because the Quran, the prophetic tradition, sources of Islam are obvious. But from the very beginning of Islam, how to interpret these sources has been a matter of debate, speculation, tension, and dispute. So when we say the head of the Fatwa Council of country A knows the truth, why not he but the Fatwa Council of country B? Or, not, or some other scholar from another denomination somewhere else? Or maybe none of these scholars, but a very bright scholar from the 13th century who wrote something which is actually more interesting than what they wrote. Uh, or a directly worse from the Quran, which we can think actually overrides what they're saying. Uh, it is, of course, for the Muslim, Islam, Quran, the prophetic tradition, Sunnah, is the ultimate source of guidance. But who interprets them? It's not that simple issue. And when you say, this person has a right to interpret, I'm saying, well, why this person and not somebody else? Maybe I like the ideas of some other scholar. And maybe I think differently from all these different scholars. So that authoritarianism is not coming from Islam. It's coming from a certain understanding of Islam. which think that, well, God's wisdom comes down through certain channels and reflected in this person. Why? I mean, that person. Well, everybody, of course, claims that wisdom because it gives you authority and it levers you. But why should we believe in that authority? Uh, there are very interesting episodes in Islamic history. Uh, one episode that I mentioned in my speech yesterday, and what also I mentioned in my book is that, it's, a, it's, it's an episode from the Battle of Bajr, the first battle Muslims had with the pagans of um, Mecca. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, you know, was the head of the army. He, uh, with him, you know, the army went, went to a certain location, and Prophet Muhammad said, if that was the night before the battle, and he said, let the army camp in this certain location. Then, very interesting, one of the Sahaba, one of his companions, comes and asks Prophet Muhammad. He asks, O oh, Prophet of God, is this a revelation from God, or is this your opinion? The Prophet Muhammad says, it's my opinion. Then he says, okay, then I have a different opinion. I think it would be better if he camp on a higher location. Prophet Muhammad listens because, you know, it's more secure and so on and so forth. He says, okay, let's do as you say. And the army does that, and that's, a, that's an advice that gave the Muslim army actually a great advantage for the Battle of Badr. Now, this is in our Islamic books, you know, like Hadith books and in our tradition. Now, very interesting story, right? Because the early Muslims make a distinction between direct divine knowledge and the personal opinion of Prophet Muhammad, I mean, that we all are supposed to follow. They ask him, and if they have a different idea, they, can, they say, maybe we should do this way. They can express that idea. Now, imagine in a world that after Prophet Muhammad, who has, even his idea could be, you know, conversed with. After him, who has divine knowledge? Who really re receives revelation in Islam? Nobody. We're not like Catholicism where you have saints that are, you know, that in Islam, right, there are caliphs, but caliphs are just the heads of the community and they follow Prophet Muhammad's path. And most of the caliphs were corrupt and horrible people, actually, throughout history, if you look after the first four. Uh, so, and they're, they're of course, learned scholars, but they're, they're, uh, their strength comes from their knowledge, but knowledge is held by other people as well. And having the knowledge of, in something doesn't mean that you're making the right decision on something. That's why I think in Islam, nobody's opinion is, can be received as divine, unquestionable knowledge. 
uh, and, and it's not a part of our religious tradition. It was not a part of our religious tradition for many centuries. However, uh, like in every other culture in Islam too, authorities wanted to elevate themselves and get divine blessings behind themselves. And you see this actually in the Umayyad era. You know, the first four caliphs that Sunni Muslims, myself included, respect as the four rightly guided caliphs, the uh, Rashidun, Hulafi Rashidun. Why? They were, the, they were the pious people, they were the genuine followers of Prophet Muhammad, they were the closest Sahaba to him. The first four. You know, the first four called themselves the caliphs of the Prophet. Caliph means successor. Uh, so they were the successors to Prophet in leading the community. And we know in many instances that their, their decisions were questioned by the community. Caliph Umar, when he was giving a, a, a khutbah in a mosque, uh, a woman stood up and said, he, he objected to the Caliph with showing a Quranic verse. And Caliph Umar listened to her and he said, okay, I, I, I made a mistake. So. That very fact that the caliph himself could be questioned by the community is very important in the very early Islam. After the uh, first four, what happened? The Umayyad dynasty established itself. And you know what the Umayyads did? They called themselves caliphs of God. Not Prophet Muhammad, but a higher position. The caliph of God. So they were the most, I mean, some, there were a few exceptional good Umayyad caliphs, if you ask me, but most of them were very corrupt. One of them was Yazid, who martyred uh, Hussein uh, one, the grandson of the Prophet. They, some of them were very horrible tyrants, I mean, Middle East. But they elevated themselves to the level of the successors of God. Uh, and they are the ones actually who establish apostasy under the Umayyad as a category in Islam. Uh, and apostates banning people, uh, killing people for apostasy became established in Islamic law during the Umayyad era. Because Umayyads, could, when they didn't like somebody, they said, you're an apostate, so I'm killing you. And you, know, but, and you would become an apostate by simply questioning the Umayyad rule. I mean, not, be, not by... Uh, so it became an easy category to blame fellow Muslims for treason. And, and uh, the treason was act against the political authority, not, not religion itself. So in our, I think, uh, faith today, we had the traces of that authoritarian retouches you know, on Islamic law. Uh, and certain reinterpretations of law for the good of that authoritarian system. We should be able to rethink some of those issues today because these, these were... Uh, uh, one example, the Umayyads, for example, used the idea of Qadr, uh, fate, to elevate and justify their rule. In what sense? Uh, they said there was an early debate in Islam between the supporters of free will versus predestination. Uh, some, Muslim said, some Muslim scholars said, God gave us free will. That's why we are being tested on this earth. That's why we'll go to heaven or hell, because since we have the free will, we make decisions and our decisions matter. That's why God should have given us freedom to choose. That's one view. The other view said, everything is predestined. We are nothing but robots. God has written everything for us. We're just following that. We have no will. We are nothing. We're just specks and we're just dust, you know, we, we, we're, we're nothing. We're like leaves uh, in the face of the wind, they said. The Umayyads supported this very fatalistic doctrine because they realized that it helps them. Because they said to their opponents, why are we on the throne? Why are we the rulers of the Muslim uh, world? Because God wills so, since we are sitting here, it's fate. It's predestination. God predestined that we should be the rulers. So whoever opposes us becomes uh, opposers of God's destination, predestination. And they executed a few scholars who defended the free will idea. So such authoritarian retouches have been made on our tradition after the Quran. And we should think today that, you know, uh, maybe they're not the best ways to understand our faith. Therefore, like the idea that you should not question the political ruler, the political ruler always, uh, every, every questioning of the political rule be a fitna. These are, I think, not coming from the Quran, but the early needs of the uh, more patriarchal authoritarian structures in our community. 
When you read the Quran, you understand if fitna is anarchy in the sense that you attack people, you bomb places, you kill people. It's, it's something that is violent. But saying something critical about the caliph became fitna and, you know, to, to, to punish that person. Uh, again, we should be uh, very careful about that. This is about the political authority, the authorities, and they're questionable. And I think in Islam, since there is, after Prophet Muhammad, there is no theocratic authority. Every authority should be responsible to the people, and their decisions should be democratically discussed and legislated. And, uh, and of course, we should follow a law if there's a law, but we should be able to challenge that law and ask campaign for, you know, removing that law, especially if it's, it violates human rights uh, and freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, and so on and so forth. But what about free speech when it questions not the political authority, but religion itself? What, what about free speech when the free speech makes fun of religion? What about Salman Rushdie writes a book about uh, satanic verses and insults uh, the prophet of Islam? What, what, what about a Danish cartoonist makes a very disrespectful cartoon again, uh, Prophet, Prophet Islam. Here are a few things. Again, first of all, the pragmatic view should be taken into account. The, on the, from the pragmatic view, I can say that if Ayatollah Khomeini did not give a fatwa on Salman Rushdie, nobody would know who Salman Rushdie is. Uh, he became one of the world's most famous writers, and the book sold millions because Ayatollah Khomeini gave this fatwa. So, I mean, the practical result of the practical result of killing somebody or threatening to kill somebody or imprisoning somebody for their attacks, real or perceived, on Islam, like intellectual or rhetorical, rhetorical attacks on Islam, especially in this day and age, has a practical reason of making that person very wealthy, prestigious, famous, uh, prolific, and, uh, and also showing the Muslims generally as incapable of responding to criticism with counter-criticism, but uh, with, with some form of authority or violence. So it practically doesn't help. We should, first of all, see that. Secondly, what does the Quran tell about that? Yes, there is a category of kufr in, in, in fiqh uh, as it developed over time. But just let's look at the Quran. What, what, in my book, I, in a certain chapter, I look at this issue. There is no verse in the Quran which says Muslims should go and kill and attack and imprison and even silence the unbelievers. There are verses about fighting the unbelievers because they have attacked Muslims in a military campaign. The Me Mecca pagans attacked Muslims and Muslims fought back to save themselves and ultimately get back to Mecca because they were driven out from Mecca. It was a, it was a political battle. It, it, it was a, actually a military battle. It was a political struggle. There are, however, many verses that tell Muslims to converse with the unbelievers. So many verses with the Quran begins with the word qala, say, to the Prophet. It says, say to the Christians, say to the Jews, say to the pagans, the idolaters. When you look at all those verses, you see God is telling Prophet Muhammad to converse with the other. And converse in, in a way that which sees their arguments. It says, for example, in one of the says, say to them, if Allah had a son, I would be the first one to worship that, uh, that son. It is taking the Christian argument seriously and giving it a serious response. It's not saying, how dare you say this and I'll behead you. It says, here's your argument, okay, here's my counter-argument. It says to the pagans, polytheists, like, if there were many gods, the universe will be in chaos, and there's one god, so everything is in order. That's an intellectual argument against, you know, what we would call paganism or idolatry or maybe atheism today. So that's very important. The Quran constantly tells the prophet to converse with other uh, traditions. That's something we should have in mind, especially when we think that, oh, if there are some un-Islamic ideas will be misled, we should look at the Quran. Those un-Islamic ideas are in the Quran. The Quran quotes them and responds to them. So I think that should be the way we should look at these issues today. But what about, what about making fun, ridiculing, and, and that sort of thing, which is disrespectful, obviously. I mean, I can have an intellectual conversation with someone if that someone has an intellectual argument. But if they just 
say rude things about my faith, you know, that's not an intellectual argument. You cannot converse with that. But what should we do then? One verse is very interesting. It says in uh, chap in the uh, Surah 6, uh, Ayah 67, when you see those who enter into false discourses about our communications, withdraw from them until they enter into some other discourse. When you see a group of people who are entering into false discourses about the Quran, who are ridiculing the Quran, maybe making fun of the Quran or Islam, it says, withdraw from them until they enter into some other discourse. It doesn't says, it doesn't say go and silence them, go and kill them, go and put them in prison. It says withdraw from them. In other words, uh, twenty-eight fifty-five. Again, the Quran states, it is it describes Muslims. The Quran describes Muslims as the people who, when they hear idle talk, they turn aside from it and say, "We shall have our deeds, and you shall have your deeds." Peace be upon you, we do not desire the ignorance. So when you see people who are rude about Islam or your faith, you say, do what you do, I'm not a part of your discussion. There are other verses in the Quran which are, give similar messages. And based on these, I think maybe the best way to respond to rude speech about Islam is to boycott it. If a newspaper puts a cartoon of Prophet Muhammad, I follow, I don't buy that newspaper anymore. I can go and protest that newspaper peacefully too. That's a matter of expression in our in, in societies. But I'm not going to bomb that newspaper or try to kill the cartoonists, uh, which is, well, wrong. I mean, that a person will die plus, again, make that person more famous and, and probably uh, confirm the accusation that Muslims are violent because that's the, that's the narrative, right? Muslims are violent. And they make a cartoon showing Islam violent, and Muslims burn the cartoonists and their and thing, in which actually is. Uh, so, but it's not even in the Quran. It says, "Do not sit with them, those rude people, because they're rude and ignorant people. They are wrong. They're, they're in the wrong discourse, and you withdraw from them. With withdrawal, we can boycott many things. I would never go to a film which mocks Islam, and I would say I will block it on my website and so on. And I can write and criticize that, and I can say uh, this is rude, and we we need civility, we need things and uh, politeness. But banning and especially using violence against those things, I think, is not what the Quran points to based on these verses. Uh, and. Uh, so when we just you know gather all of this, I think freedom of speech is not something we Muslims should fear from. If we have confidence in our faith, and if we have the will to stand for our faith with intellectualism, early Muslims did this. Uh, the early Muslim community faced when they created a big Islamic empire, they faced different schools of thought. They learned from Greeks. They learned from uh, Jews and Christians, Aristotle, Plato, these, their were books were translated into Arabic and read by Muslim scholars. And, well, there were some people who said, this is kufr, we shouldn't read these. They were the precursors of the Salafi thought uh, in medieval Islam. But other Muslim uh, thinkers said, let's read Aristotle, let's look at it from a Muslim point of view, and they reinterpreted it at, at some point. So they, they changed and, you know, they they put him in an Islamic framework uh, reference. And Al-Kindi, the great philosopher of the Arabs, for example, was an Arist Aristotle interpreter and a great Islamic scholar. And some of his findings in mathematics and literature and philosophy went to the West and became uh, one of the uh, sparks for, and, and later others like Farabi, Ibn Rushd, and so on and so forth. So that was a time that Muslims were not this... Uh, lacking self-confidence. They were, they had the faith and they had this self-confidence and with that grounding they could look at different intellectual traditions, read them, qu question them, converse with them, synthesize some of their findings with Islam and create the Islamic civilization uh, with, with all its intellectual achievements. I think that's what we need today and uh, we can never tolerate disrespectful uh, libels and then we will shut the conversation with those people, we will boycott and, you know, with peaceful protests we can condemn those people. 
but there's no point in using violence. And plus, if there are conflict, confusing ideas, they're good ideas. We should be confused a little bit, so we'll sit down to learn and think how to defend our faith. Otherwise, we'll be always protected, but if you protect the child too much, you know, that child doesn't learn how to struggle with the outside world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh,